Welcome to the direct fuel injection class. To give you some background on uh, what this class is about and, and sort of what the um, background is on, on direct fuel injection, uh, one of the reasons we're taking a look at it is because just about every manufacturer uh, today in an effort to increase uh, fuel mileage, lower emissions, that sort of thing, uh, they're, they're kind of switching over to this system simply because it's the only way to get the job done anymore. So uh, a short list here of manufacturers that uh, are currently using direct injection, Ford for sure, GM, uh, Mercedes, BMW, Mazda, Volkswagen, Audi, uh, Mitsubishi, Toyota, and I would expect the list to grow um, you know, right across the whole um, vehicle manufacturing line within the next few years. In fact, the whole Ford uh, EcoBoost technology that they're that you're seeing all the commercials about and the bragging and all that kind of stuff is all built around this direct injection mod model. Now Ford has taken it a step further in that they've combined it with turbocharging, but the bottom line is the the key to EcoBoost is direct fuel injection. One of the surprising things that I found out when I was putting this class together was um, just what a energy waster the internal combustion is and if you take a look at the picture up here at the top of the screen you can see that if I put uh, a gallon of gasoline into this thing which has 100 percent of the energy available in the gallon of gasoline I'm actually getting about 13 14 percent to actually drive the rear wheels the engine itself uh, combines or consumes a fair amount of that energy as does the drive line but the overall problem here is the engine itself is not very efficient. It's not very efficient in, in converting the energy in the gasoline uh, into actual usable energy that we can use to propel the car. Now manufacturers have been working on this over the years and they've actually, believe it or not, in the last hundred or so years that we've had the internal combustion engine around here, they haven't really been able to improve on this a whole much. We have uh, maybe gone from about 25% efficiency overall uh, to maybe 30 or 35 percent efficiency overall, but uh, there's a lot of wasted energy in a gasoline engine. One of the problems being that on the uh, intake stroke, especially when the air is cold, it lowers the combustion, or it, this lowers the, the temperature of the combustion chamber. And what that, what that results in is, as the gasoline comes in and hits the relatively cold air, even though it's being injected under high pressure and fairly well atomized coming out of the injector, as soon as the gasoline hits the cold air, it starts to condense again and form into bigger droplets, which means that there's, there's less of the fuel exposed to air, so I don't have combustion as efficient as it should be. And this is one of the things that they're trying to address with direct injection. So, a couple of statements here. Absorption of heat during vaporization of the gasoline in the combustion chamber uh, further causes a temperature drop, resulting in inefficient com combustion, which is what we were just sort of talking about there. And then injection of the gasoline into the combustion chamber on the intake stroke cannot ensure gasoline being vaporized completely and mixed with air rapidly for efficient combustion. The more I can atomize the gasoline, break it apart, uh, the more of the gasoline that is exposed to oxygen, which means you know the smaller the drop, uh, the more of it, then the more more bang for the buck or the more energy I can extract because combustion becomes just that much more efficient. In the current sort of gasoline fuel injected model, we're, we're, we're somewhat defeating that purpose by injecting cold air. On a direct injected engine, uh, some of these issues can be addressed. Fuel under high pressure has less time to condense in the intake manifold. So if I put the pressure up high enough, I can spray the fuel in faster so it's not hanging around as long. Therefore, it has less time to condense. And if I can get the pressure up and the nozzle size uh, down, then when the fuel comes out of the injector, it's, there's more vaporization or um, the fuel is broken apart into smaller particles right from the beginning. So both of these by themselves kind of help a lot. But being able to put the fuel in the combustion chamber directly as opposed to having it sit behind the intake valve means that the fuel charge is somewhat isolated from that relatively cold intake charge uh, further promoting fuel vaporization and when you get a look at how they actually um, carry out this uh, 
direct injection and, and when they inject the fuel into the cylinder, you'll see that they've reduced this even further. So the course objectives are, we're going to cover system operation. We're going to go into detail uh, on most of the components of the system, explain how they work. We're going to take a look at the individual component operation. We're going to spend a fair bit of time on the high pressure side of the system, not so much on the low pressure side of the system because the low pressure side of the system is basically uh, standard stuff that you guys have been working with for years. Uh, we're going to take a look at modes of operation of these systems, which is something that we typically haven't had to deal with before. We'll take a look at system electrical operation. Uh, there are some things here that you need to know about the electronics on the vehicle so that you don't make, um, uh, don't make mistakes, don't get hurt. We'll take a look at system diagnosis, some service precautions, and at the end of the class, we'll go through some case studies of cars that we worked on over the last year or so uh, and, and what we ran into when we were working on them. Now, up next is a short video that kind of demonstrates the difference between conventional uh, fuel injection operation and direct fuel injection operation. So we'll take a minute here and, and view the video. Now, when we play the video here, two things to keep in mind or two things to watch out for. The first part of the video is going to deal with conventional fuel injection. So take a look at uh, what the fuel looks like coming in. You can actually see the air coming in and how long it takes to fuel the cylinder. When we play the second part of the video, which is a direct injected vehicle, take a look at not only how fast or how quickly the cylinder is fueled, but when um, the fuel is actually injected into the combustion chamber. Now, in addition to directly injecting fuel into the combustion chamber, uh, this direct injection technology, or DI, now allows the engine to run in what we call stratified charge mode during light load situations. And briefly, what stratified charge mode means is, and if you, if you want, you can write this into your handout, anything leaner than lambda 1 or anything leaner than 14.7 to 1 is stratified charge. So if I'm running down the road at uh, lambda 1.1 or lambda 1.2 or a fuel mixture of 17 to 1 or some such 20 to 1 um, then I'm running in stratified charge mode now obviously we're not going to make a whole lot of power here and it doesn't suit all sort of driving situations but under light load situations the engine can be leaned out quite a bit because we have less chance with this with a stratified charge of a misfire in some cases <clears throat> The mode or the, um, the fuel mixtures can be as lean as 1.5 to 1 or 3.0 uh, lambda, which is an air fuel ratio somewhere between 20 and 45 to 1. So with this technology, the air fuel mixtures are getting extremely lean in some cases. Now, here's a picture of an engine running in stratified charge mode. You can see here that we're leaner than lambda 1. You can also see that injection takes place uh, late on the compression stroke very very similar to the way a diesel engine would operate you will also notice on these engines that the piston is contoured and the charge coming out of the fuel injector is also shaped between the contouring of the piston and the fuel coming out of the fuel injector the actual fuel that's being injected in is basically being directed at the electrode on the spark plug and if you think about it an engine that's running at about 30 to 1 is extremely lean most engines or most gasoline engines start to misfire, lean misfire around 16, 17 to 1. So at 30 to 1, uh, that's an extreme possibility here. However, if we shoot the fuel charge at the spark plug, um, we kind of get around that a little bit. And, and what you wind up with is, yes, the overall fuel mixture is 30 to 1, but around the tip of the spark plug, the fuel mixture is um, rich enough to promote combustion. So that's the way the engine sort of works in stratified charge mode. It will switch over to homogeneous mode. Homogeneous mode is basically the mode that we've been dealing with all along. Uh, stoichiometric or 14.7 to 1 or lambda 1 is a homogeneous mode. So anything that's sort of lambda 1, 14.7 to 1 or richer is the uh, homogeneous mode. Anything that's leaner than 14.7 to 1 is stratified charge mode. When the engine is running in homogeneous mode, basically we're looking at uh, normal combustion here. Injection takes place on the in intake stroke, similar to current port injection systems. 
and all of this stuff you're very familiar with so there's no point in going over it again but you need to be aware that the engine control system will switch back and forth between the two modes of operation depending on engine load temperature that sort of thing now in order to control the fuel mixture for stratified charge mode obviously an oxygen sensor is not going to be able to cut it here so most of these engines use a wideband oxygen sensor to control uh, or to measure fuel mixture electronic throttle controls are also utilized here I mean we've got a sort of a merging of a bunch of technologies that allow us to get away with um, stratified charge mode and it brings some other benefits as well one of the main uh, restrictions or one of the main inefficiency of a gasoline engine is the need to throttle it which results in pumping loss the engine is actually uh, working harder to pull the air in than it should because of that stupid throttle plate stuck in the road that's one of the reasons why uh, an EGR valve can actually increase fuel economy because it means we have to open the throttle a little bit further and reduce pumping loss with EGR flowing into the engine now this is a chart this is actually a Bosch chart uh, taken of a vehicle operating in stratified charge mode and you can see on the left uh, of the chart the stratified charge mode mode of operation you can see that the torque uh, requirement is very low and if you take a look at when the vehicle is in stratified charge mode the throttle valve for the most part is is held very very close to the wide open throttle position and which would mean that it's running pretty much like a diesel engine at this point it is basically a diesel engine with a spark plug the only difference being uh, we need that spark plug to ignite the mixture also uh, very very similar to a diesel engine we're controlling RPM now by uh, how much fuel we inject as opposed to uh, how open or closed we have the throttle and you can see the air fuel ratio graph at the bottom obviously when we're in stratified charge mode we're running very very lean and then if you take a look at the graph on the right or the set of um, uh, the homogeneous mode which is the gray area to the right of the, the, the graph there as soon as torque hits a certain limit the throttle will go back to following the driver's foot and we see the air fuel ratio drop down to lambda 1 or 14.7 so the car will depending on load temperature rpm switch back and forth between the two modes now it's invisible to the driver obviously but uh, it can make for some interesting diagnosis if you're watching this stuff on a scan tool so just be aware that the car is going to switch back and forth between these two modes and it will not alert anybody let alone the driver now on direct injection systems there are two sort of basic fuel delivery systems an in-tank mounted fuel pump electric uh, to deliver fuel to the high pressure system now this is the conventional system that we've been using for years and years and years this is now going to be referred to as the low pressure or primary supply system the high pressure fuel system is uh, separate it is basically um, used at the engine end of things so the low pressure system delivers fuel to the high pressure system and the high pressure system then bumps the fuel pressure up and we'll explain how that is done to give us the required pressure for um, direct injection now if you take a look at this sort of diagram you can see here that uh, everything up to the high pressure pump everything up to the high pressure pump is uh, conventional we've got our uh, canister our fuel tank our in-tank pump uh, the delivery lines all that kind of stuff our evap system all of that would be considered part of the low pressure fuel system and it's nothing more than a conventional returnless style system everything from the pump on in into the engine itself you can see is high pressure including the high pressure uh, pump the high pressure uh, fuel injector there's a high pressure fuel sensor all that sort of thing and I don't know if we've mentioned it before but I'll mention it here the reason uh, for the high pressure uh, on these systems is that the fuel is being injected directly into the combustion chamber therefore 40 or 50 psi uh, just simply won't cut it if we were to use 40 or 50 psi at the injector tip as soon as the piston comes up on the compression stroke which is where we want to inject the fuel it would blow it would it would pump combustion or it would pump the air fuel mixture back up into the injector so that's not going to work uh, typically we need uh, injection pressures that are very high and we'll talk about those pressures coming up 
The rest of the engine management system uh, is stuff that you should already be familiar with, so there's no, re needs, there's no reason to go back over it. As far as the fuel pumps go themselves, uh, I've got a couple of examples here uh, just showing what you may or may not run into, but the bottom line here is the fuel delivery system, the low pressure side of things, is all conventional. It's all stuff that you've run into before. Now, this you may not be familiar with unless you do a lot of work on Ford, but most manufacturers have gone to some kind of a PCM controlled pump for the low pressure system. These systems typically have a separate fuel driver module. Uh, and they use some sort of a pulse with modulated fuel pump and a fuel pressure sensor for feedback to the PCM. There are pressure taps that will fit a regular fuel gauge on the low pressure side of things. There are no uh, fuel pressure taps on the high pressure side. So scan tool communication with the fuel driver module requires the correct software and this is one of the issues that we've had with some aftermarket scan tools as they cannot always access these fuel modules which makes difficult uh, which makes diagnosing these systems very, very difficult. So if you're getting into one of these things, you may want to consider an OE type scan tool or make sure that the aftermarket scan tool that you're using has the proper software to communicate with the fuel driver modules. Typically on these systems, uh, you're looking at 40 to 60 PSI, usually a couple of them. Volkswagen in particular, the fuel pressure can get a little bit higher than that. Uh, in some cases, 90 to 100 PSI. Please, please, please underline this. The low pressure system must be verified before you start going after the high pressure system. If you've got a problem with uh, lack of power, you go in and you look at the um, wideband sensor or you look at fuel trims and you decide the engine's running lean, before you start um, blaming the high pressure system, you, you must make sure that the low pressure system is working okay. And in most systems, or in most cases, that inst that involves either reading the low fuel pressure uh, sensor or uh, putting a fuel pressure gauge on and checking the fuel pressure. So pretty simple as far as, as testing on, on that end of the system goes.